We're talking about the apostolic fathers and the patristic writers, depending on how you want to talk about it. But I want to talk some about these things that are ancient documents, some from the first or second century, that many people consider to be important, um, you know, a capture of traditions of Christians. But uh, what you're going to find, rather, is that the Bible said of itself that it was complete, that it was ready. The apostles said they were writing these things down and that we could refer back to these things and we should accept no other gospel and we should watch out for imposters. And they were right about that, of course, not only in that age, but in our age. But I think it's worth looking at these documents that are considered to be, by some, authoritative documents, an authoritative reference showing what was believed at that time. And I think it's interesting that they are uh, attested to be very old, and so you can see what was being taught at that time by some. So I wanted to talk about this one called the Didache, which is the teaching. And what they mean by the teaching is the teaching of the 12 apostles. What is this thing? Well, I went ahead and used an encyclopedia to try and explain it. Quoting from Britannica, we say, it is the oldest surviving Christian church order, probably written in Egypt or Syria in the second century. Meaning it's considered to be the oldest of the church fathers, the apostolic fathers, the patristic, patristic writers, whatever you want to call that. It's considered to be the oldest one, which I find interesting. It wasn't too surprising to find, you know, the religion of Constantine in the 300s was pretty different from the New Testament church. It really didn't have anything to do with the New Testament church, as far as we could tell. It just lifted the names. The Didache, though, is not in 300s. It's very close in the 100s. And they said it's considered patristic literature from an unknown apostolic father, meaning somebody who was alive when the apostles were alive, is who is thought to have been writing this thing. When you read it, you know, the first line, the title that it has within itself is the teaching of the Lord through the 12 apostles to the nations. That's what it claims to be. The document itself claims to be this. Uh, didache is just a way of saying teaching in Greek. But um, it says about itself the teaching of the Lord through the 12 apostles to the nations. That's what it claims to be. The encyclopedia says it's an ancient document from the 100s, probably by somebody who would have been alive at the time the apostles were alive. And that is all plausible. I'm going to accept that as very likely to be accurate, that somebody back there who had some kind of claim to authority, because they were alive when the apostles were alive, was able to pen this and cause it to be preserved. But the thing that's really critical, um, there's a, it's about 16 or 17 chapters, I forget. Um, they're not very long chapters. But there's a lot of things in there. There's a lot of stuff that it says. And uh, I was, you know, I've got notes on that, keeping track of them verse by verse of different things that are in there um, and how they compare to what the Bible says about these same topics and um, there are lots of them, and maybe one day I'll put those somewhere, a uh, commentary or a book of some kind, but uh, class material, you know. But for now, I think the, ri the right thing to do, the best thing for us to do, is to focus in on the one truly critical thing that's happening there. There's an entire chapter, which is actually only uh, four or six verses or something, but an entire chapter of the Didache 
de devoted to baptism. And I think that is a critical issue that has to be understood um, and is probably, in some sense, what you need to know about the didache. It's interesting to see the other things that it espouses, um, thinking about how familiar they sound to me from some of my brethren. But um, the thing about baptism <clears throat> is that it's the most important thing to understand for, for a specific reason. When they say in the, in the title of their text, the teaching of the Lord through the 12 apostles to the nations, you know, that's a reference to Matthew 28, to the, to the Great Commission. And it's ironic that it would say that because the biggest, uh, most glaring false teaching that is done in this document is the chapter about baptism. Where, whereas Jesus had said, go, you know, baptize them, teaching the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, this thing gets baptism all wrong. And so it's the single most important to understand. And the reason for that, as I say, it's, it's for a reason. The reason for that is that if you look at the other things that they say that are at variance with the Bible, you know, Christians could misunderstand some of those things. They might not get that right. Or they may not understand that at first. That I can get. The didache contains errors and misunderstandings of the text. And there are some Christians who could do some of those things, who could misunderstand some of the same kinds of things. But if you don't understand baptism, you don't know how to become a Christian. So there's no way that you could be a Christian. That's the, why it's a critical error. Because that's telling you something about this text. The baptism of the scriptures is how you become a Christian. If this document is teaching a different kind of baptism, and it is, what it, if they're teaching something that's different about what it takes to become a Christian, then the document clearly never had any circulation among Christians. There was nobody who was a Christian who believed what the didache says about baptism. They perhaps, they thought they were Christians, they used the names and you know, quoted verses and things, but they're not because they don't know what baptism is or what it's for or how it works or what's required in the Bible. So that's why it's the critical thing, and I think it's kind of the, the sermon shortcut, if you will, it would be a, an entire series if we were trying to cover all the different things that you can find in there that are, that are troublesome. I think the one thing you really need to understand is what it says about baptism. Because that's telling you very clearly that this document is fraudulent. These are not Christians. Whoever wrote this is no Christian. Whoever obeys this is no Christian. And no Christian would be confused about these things. Maybe some of the others, but not about baptism. So let's get started. It's You don't have a copy of the D.K., I will guess, which is fine. But it's their seventh chapter where they talk about baptism. The first thing I want to point out with regard to this teaching is that the D.K. wants or requires um, running water. Actually, it wants running water. It says there, Baptize in this way, I'm quoting. Baptize in this way, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, in running water. Some of that should sound familiar to you, but that last part there, in running water, you never read that in the Bible. <laughs> but if you do not have access to running water, baptize in other water. I don't know exactly what that means. But they very clearly say, 
it should be done like this. And here is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, a direct reference to Matthew 28's Great Commission. But they've added running water here. And I've definitely heard Christians ask about this. I always wondered, why would you, where did that even come from? How did that even occur to you? <laughs> I guess now you know. Well, nowhere does the Bible mention running water for baptism. That's not part of it. It doesn't say anything about that. Um, in fact, if you're looking closely at the text, you have um, Acts chapter 8, where um, Philip the evangelist is going down a road, and there's um, an Ethiopian slave, a, a Jew, who had been taken captive, made into a eunuch. But he had been worshiping in Jerusalem, and now he's on his way back home. They're going along the road and come to some water. When the eunuch says, see, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? You notice that when they do this, there's no mention of running water. <coughs> what kind of water is it? Well, it doesn't tell you what kind of water. In Acts chapter 8 and 36, it doesn't tell you this. In fact, there's nowhere in the Bible anywhere where it tells you what kind of water it was, whether it was running or not. That's just not a consideration in the Bible. Um, in Acts 10, in 47, when Peter calls for the baptism of the Romans who have come to believe, he says, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these? Um, withholding the water or, or refusing the water, like we could understand or we could imagine somebody refusing to fill a tub or fill a pool so that people could be baptized, you know, that kind of thing makes sense, but... If it has to be running water, how do you stop people? How do you stop running water? Like, that, that would be a stream. In ancient times, that would be a stream or a river. <laughs> how are you going to stop a river or stop a stream? How can you withhold the stream to keep people from being baptized? It doesn't make any sense. It can't be done. And don't say Roman plumbing. We're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> so first there's that running water thing. That's odd. Completely foreign to the Bible. Then you have this cold water. Cold water. And I remember that was a problem when I was baptized, literally. <laughs> it was in December and it was very cold in Fort Worth, and the heater was out in that building. And uh, the man who baptized me was an older gentleman and could not get in that water. So we had to travel to a different building where there was a heater. But according to the DDOC, hey, we did it wrong. If you're not able to baptize with cold water, then baptize with warm water. So they want cold water baptism. And that's interesting. I guess they really want you to wake up or something. I have no idea. It's a weird thing to say. It literally says, if you're not able to baptize with cold water, then baptize with warm water. Nowhere does the Bible mention water temperature with regard to baptism. It's just not a consideration in the scriptures. It never talks about this. However, Peter warned us in 2 Peter 3.16 that some twist the scriptures to their own destruction. They twist them or they stretch them. And you know, there is a place in the Gospel of Matthew where he speaks of giving someone a cup of cold water, just a cup of cold water, which is all the authority some people need in religion. That's good enough for them. It's like Pharaoh being good with the red food coloring for the blood, the Nile turned to blood, you know? He thought that was good enough. Sometimes people are willing to twist the scriptures, and that would be a place. Matthew mentions a cup of cold water in chapter 10 and 42. That is twisted. That's a big stretch, talking about Jesus saying, oh, if anyone gives you just a cup of cold water, he'll not lose his reward. What does that have to do with baptized people in cold water? Nothing. Nothing at all. That would be really twisted. <coughs> But the other thing is that the same verse, uh, if you will, the parallel account in Mark 9, 41, 
doesn't mention that the water is cold. So if you're thinking to yourself that the scriptures require cold water for baptism because Jesus mentioned a cup of cold water in a place, well, that's not even backed up by Mark. That's an incidental. It's not a critical. The other thing that the DDK talks about is pouring, and that's what we were talking when we said Roman plumbing. Yeah, they could pour water, theoretically. Um, and the DDK calls for that. If you possess neither, that is, neither running water nor cold water, pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, it literally says pouring water. Well, and three times. I don't know why three times. It just does. The Bible never says pour water for baptism. There's no mention of pouring water anywhere on the head three times, one time, any times. It's just not biblical at all. Nothing in Scripture says this. Perhaps somebody would want to twist the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts 10.45 because the Spirit was poured out on the Gentiles. But no, that's not the same thing. It's, you know, you might want to twist the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is described as pouring into baptism can be a pour, but no, because it's not the same baptism. In Acts 10, 47 and 48, Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these who have received the Spirit? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's a different thing. In fact, when you look through the rest of Scripture, for example, John 3 and verse 23, you find that John the Baptist has located his operation at Ainon near Salim because water was plentiful there. John the Baptist believed that you needed to have plentiful water if you were going to be baptizing. If it had been authorized to pour water on the head, then you would really only need to have a pitcher of water or perhaps a basin of water, as you see in modern religions. In Acts 8 and 38, when that eunuch we referred to earlier decided to be baptized, the record says that the man Philip and the eunuch both went down into the water where he baptized him. That's not a cup of water. That's not a pitcher of water. It's not a flow from a pipe. That's a large amount of water. So the Bible doesn't talk about flowing water or running water versus still water. The Bible doesn't talk about hot water versus cold water. But it does talk about how much water, plentiful, enough for adults to get down into. And it's enough water. If John is baptizing because there's a bunch of water in that physical location, we're talking about bodies of water there. And if the eunuch is waiting until they get to this body of water, the amount of water that the Bible's talking about is much greater than the amount of water that can be poured symbolically on somebody's head. <laughs> Unless you really hate them, I guess. <laughs> You're not going to want to see a river unleashed on their forehead. Now, in fact, in Acts 8 and 36, what you're finding is this eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And I would argue that implies now what now prevents me. He couldn't do it earlier because there wasn't enough water. Now there's enough water. How do I know there's not enough water? Because he's traveling from Jerusalem by chariot, yes, but traveling from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia, where he is from. And not on, you know, Southwest Airlines or even Spirit Airlines. It's going to take him days, many days. You know, therefore, that he has water to drink in the caravan. He absolutely has water to drink in the caravan. If the Bible definition of baptism included pouring on the forehead, especially if you didn't have cold water or running water to work with, as the DDK says, then I guess Philip got it wrong. 
And the eunuch got it wrong. They shouldn't have waited until they got to a body of water. They had water in the caravan. Why didn't he just pour it on him right then? Why did they wait? If the didache is right, but no, it's not. The Bible is showing you the didache is wrong. Why, he should have taken water from the travel gear and poured it on the eunuch's head. They waited, and they didn't need to. No, that's false. They did need to. You know, the word baptism itself is defined. It's a, it's a clear uh, word that means something. Bapto, ba baptize in Greek, is the word that means immerse or dip into water. It actually comes from the process of dyeing cloth when they would use a stick to, and they would jab the cloth, you know, the cloth would be floating in the dying water, they would jab it down to dunk it down into the water to get it completely covered by the dye. The sound of hitting that thing and the water, you know, lapping up over the top and closing is bapt. It's onomatopoeia. <laughs> That's where this word comes from. It's the sound of the water sealing over the top. You know, the Bible definition of baptism is, is immersion, a full dip. They use this like uh, the blacksmith, if he was tempering steel, he puts it into the water to cool it. How much of it is in the water? All of it. <laughs> it's completely under the water. They use this for drawing water by dipping a bucket. Well, it has to get under the water surface to, to dip, doesn't it? Yes, it does. They use this word for a ship that sank. Well, if it sank, that means it's completely underwater, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So the word the Bible used is a very clear and honest Greek word, and it means dip. So any idea that it's pouring or sprinkling or any of these others is just completely foreign to Scripture. Nothing could be more false. And if that's what a person did, a person hasn't actually been baptized the way that the Lord commands baptism. The other thing you read there in the Didache in the seventh chapter is they want you to prep. They want fasting prep. I did that one for my friend Andrew. <laughs> fasting prep. Yes, before the baptism, the baptizer should fast beforehand. And the one being baptized and any others who are able should also uh, fast. Call upon the one being baptized to fast beforehand for one or two days. The Didache says, The Bible, of course, nowhere mentions fasting in connection with a baptism. Nowhere does it talk about people fasting or being called upon to fast. For those who are inclined to stretch the scriptures, twist the scriptures to their own destruction, they might look at Saul, who saw the vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus and ate or drank nothing for three days when Ananias was sent to him and he obeyed the gospel when he was baptized. That's really twisted, man. He was not told, don't eat or drink anything. He never said to anybody else, don't eat or drink anything. Nowhere in Scripture is it being called uh, or placed upon anybody else. That's pretty twisted. That's not Bible authority. Besides which, it proves too much. If you like the example of Saul because he didn't eat or drink, you know the other thing he didn't do? See, he was blind. <laughs> So you got to call on them to fast for three days, and also you need to strike them blind, apparently, if that's the pattern. But it's not. That's not the pattern. In fact, the man who went to him, Ananias, who baptized him, is not fasting. He lives in the city of Damascus, where Saul was taken, where Saul has been sitting, not moving because he's blind, and eating and drinking nothing. He lives right there. When the Lord told him to go, he went to the place where Saul was staying, entered the house in Damascus, Acts 9, verse 8. Saul 
on hearing these things arose and was baptized. Immediately, the scales fell from his eyes. He's, he's a Christian. There's no indication that Ananias waited or was fasting or allowed there to be a period of time during which he could fast or any kind of delay. He lives in the same city, so God sent him to go and baptize Saul. It looks like you know he, he got there the same day. Paul arose and was baptized immediately. There's nothing in Scripture that says that. In fact, when Paul comes back in Acts 22 and retells this story, and he tells the, the court what Ananias said to him, the words in Acts 22.16 are, And now, why do you wait? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. You know, when Paul tells this, Ananias said to him, What are you waiting for? He did not say, Saul, have you been fasting? <laughs> I'll come back in two or three days. Don't eat anything. Now, that doesn't say that anywhere. Ananias said, what are you waiting for? And he's right. In fact, when you look at all the, well, when you look at the majority of the accounts in Acts of people being baptized, the Bible does not call for a delay. The Bible says, don't delay. Do not wait. Acts 2.41, the first place where Peter commands them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins. And it says in Acts 2.41, those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000. Not those who received his words also received the instruction to wait around two or three days fasting. No. And look for some cold water that's running. No, nothing in the Bible about any such matter. That day, they who received that word were baptized. That's immediacy, not delay. The eunuch, the same way. Philip joins the chariot. They study the Bible together, starting at Isaiah 53. The very next point at which they come to some water, he says, see, here's water. Acts 8.36, now what hinders me from being baptized? Nothing. They go right down into that water. The Bible emphasizes immediacy, not delay. There's nothing in here about, oh, yes, now you have to fast. It doesn't say that. In Acts 10, which we referred to earlier, where Peter is speaking to the Romans and the Holy Spirit falls upon them, he says... Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these? You know who can? The DDOC. It's withholding the water for baptizing them because they still need to wait. They still need to fast. And so does Peter, if he's going to baptize them, according to the DDOC. But according to the Bible, can anybody withhold that water? They've just received the Holy Spirit. They've just come to believe in God, and now they're ready to be baptized immediately? Yes, immediately. That's always what the Bible says. Immediately, not delayed. Acts 16, the Ethiop I'm sorry, the Philippian jailer. Philippian jailer takes Paul and um, his travel companion who were in, in his jail, in his custody, the same hour of the night that they are preaching the gospel to him, he washes their wounds, and then he is baptized at once, he and all his family. They didn't wait till the sun came up. They didn't wait till the next day. They didn't start their three-day fast. In Acts 19, when Paul is talking to some who believed in Jesus but did not know the baptism of Jesus, they only knew the baptism of John. When he explained to them the baptism of Jesus, it says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So when they heard the rest of what John had been teaching, 
and the, what Jesus teaches about being baptized according to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. When they heard that, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Bible says don't delay. Every example you can point to is not a place where they wait and they fast and they're looking for cold water and running water. There's no mention of any of those things. They're completely foreign to the Bible. So that's the thing that I want to get across is that really, it's the most critical thing. Their claim to be based in the Great Commission, you know, the Didache, hey, the teaching of the 12 apostles to the nations, the teaching of the Lord through his 12 apostles to the nations. That's a claim to be the Great Commission, a document that they penned, apparently, or the, the teaching they were doing that was supposed to be spread. That's a lie. They really got this wrong. The baptism that's required there, according to the rest of the Scripture, is a complete um, a dip in water without regard to the temperature of the water or whether it happens to be moving at the time. That's not relevant to the Scriptures. And their commandment that people should be fasting before they are baptized is nowhere found in Scripture. Nowhere does the Bible show that this is the case. In every case, they talk about doing this and doing it now. At the moment that you realize that you are lost in sin and that you need forgiveness, that's the time to obey. So that's the critical thing about the didache, I think, that needs to be understood. There's a lot of other things that are troublesome there. But like we said before, the criticality of this problem, of misunderstanding baptism, is they're not even Christians. If you have allowed water to be poured on your head, you know, instead of being completely buried, submerged in water, you have not been baptized according to the Bible. If you allowed water to be sprinkled on your head, instead of being submerged, baptized, you haven't been baptized in the Bible definition of baptism. The water that Peter asked about, can anybody forbid? Yes, many religions forbid it. That's why you had water poured on your head or you had water sprinkled on you instead of the water that is required according to the Scriptures. Enough water to be dipped in. Those people are not Christians. The people who wrote this thing are not Christians. The thing that they wrote will not make Christians. If you follow the, the Didache, you're not a Christian. That's why it's the critical thing. It's called apostolic fathers or patristic writers, right? These are considered early Christian literature. But that's the one thing that you can be quite certain is not true. Whoever wrote this is no Christian. They don't know how to become a Christian. The Bible way. So that's a lie. That's a pretender. That's an imposter. What is it? It's the guy that Paul warned you about, right? <laughs> Satan arrays himself as an angel of light. Well, what about you? Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins? You know, in Luke's gospel, Jesus talks about John's baptism and how it was preparing the way, you know, preparing the hearts. And he talked about how blessed it was, um, you know, to be a part of what John was doing and to have that right attitude. And it turns out that, you know, some who were present had done exactly what uh, John commanded, which is recorded for us, in, or yeah, recorded for us in Luke chapter 7. Beginning at verse 28, he said, I tell you, among those born of women, none is greater than John, yet the one who's least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard this, tax collectors too, they declared God just, since they had been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, 
they rejected the purpose of God for themselves since they had not been baptized by John. Have you accepted God's purpose for you by being baptized in the name of Jesus? Or have you rejected God's purpose for yourself and gone along with what men say and what men think instead? You need to be saved, you know? We all do. And we're doing it not our way. Or it's, it's not my tradition. It's not my idea. It's, this is what we come to from an honest reading of the Bible. Have you accepted God's purpose for yourself to become a, a Christian, to become a child of God? Well, we have water prepared that you might be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins. We'd be glad to help you. If you are a Christian today, the usefulness of these things is to understand that there are a lot of historic, competing, contemporaneous documents out there like the Didache, and we will look at some others as well, that many religious traditions consider authoritative. Um, I didn't say anything about it, but you probably recognize some of those practices that you read in the Didache. You probably can think of some churches that do those things. And that's true. And they have they claim legitimacy, they claim originality, that they are the church of Christ, that they're the ancient, the orthodox, and that's not true. This is the church of Christ. This is the ancient. It's the orthodoxy of God. The Bible is right. Come back to this, the Bible. That's the thing that shows you what needs to be done. And save yourself from this wicked generation. If you need the prayers of the saints today, if you need to be baptized in the name of Christ for forgiveness of sins, we stand ready to help you. Please let your need in the Spirit be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.